would like to uh, go through this topic, and, and my approach is really to uh, bring up some of the issues uh, that are out there, uh, both on the front end with uh, harvest and storage, and also on, on the back end with feeding. And uh, I'm not sure in a lot of these there's clear blanket black and white uh, recommendations that go across uh, every farm, but uh, certainly I think we can uh, lay out for you what we've uh, put up on the website in terms of resources and uh, lay out there some of the issues and, and the discussions that have gone on uh, over the past uh, few weeks really within, uh, within the state. And uh, I want to acknowledge Pat Hoffman, uh, certainly he's done a lot of work uh, really on the malt and uh, preservation area. Pat uh, could not be with us today, so I'll uh, present uh, for both of us. And also there uh, is information that uh, Mike Rankin has put together, uh, Fond du Lac County agent, and uh, I'll share some of that information as well. Uh, he has some publications up on the Team Grains website as well. So, as I mentioned, I'd like to break this out into uh, harvest and storage issues and prior to moving into uh, feeding issues. And as I look at the, the harvest and storage issues, obviously wet corn, uh, certainly the kind of the, uh, pull through on this topic has been the mold mycotoxin concern. But there are other issues with uh, wet corn, uh, certainly from the standpoint of starch content, uh, nutrient composition, test weight. If that corn did not uh, reach maturity uh, prior to the frost, uh, that can affect uh, feeding programs. Uh, there's certainly potentially some silage, silo fermentation issues with, with high moisture grains. Uh, we certainly have the mold uh, mycotoxin uh, issue out there, and, and Paul has addressed that, and, and I'll make uh, some comments as well. And then finally, typically with uh, wet, very wet high moisture corn, uh, we do have some concerns about yeast uh, coming through the field, which can really affect things in, in two ways. One, uh, an effect on the fermentation profile, driving that to more of an ethanol fermentation which can affect uh, performance of cows, and then also uh, yeast having an impact on the aerobic stability when we uh, try to feed that corn out uh, as we go through the spring uh, and even into next summer uh, feeding period. So I've laid out uh, some of the options that uh, have been discussed uh, for the past uh, few weeks as, as we've looked at the situation. And I've kind of listed uh, three here. Uh, first on that list is uh, snaplage. And that's uh, essentially taking uh, corn that's uh, quite wet and harvesting the full ear, husk, ear shank, uh, cob, and kernel. And depending on the hybrid that's uh, being harvested and, and uh, how that equipment's set up, uh, maybe some of uh, the upper part of, of the stalk. Um, so that's uh, one uh, that's fairly limited in terms of the people that have that equipment ready to go and the ability to, uh, to harvest uh, uh, that way. Uh, but it does give the advantage of it can be harvested now, so to speak, or even yesterday, in that you're not uh, waiting for a kernel moisture uh, from the standpoint of a, of a combine, combine harvest. Uh, next is, is certainly high moisture corn, and I'm going to just talk about high moisture shelled corn because with the um, amount of discussion that's gone on regarding mold in the field, uh, one of the things we learned in 1993 when we had a, a major issue like this on a statewide basis was that uh, quite a bit of the mycotoxin in mold uh, does travel with the cob. So the longer we're waiting for dry down to harvest this high moisture corn, um, the more we would certainly recommend uh, leaving the cob in the field and, and harvesting shelled corn. And then lastly here would also be uh, dry uh, shelled corn. So harvesting uh, now, uh, trying to get certainly under 30% moisture or even lower would be desirable, and then drying and storing uh, in a dry form. One of the questions that's really ensued is what is the maximum moisture content for preserving high moisture corn? Uh, 
with the snap leach type material where you are uh, harvesting the husk and the ear shank and, and cob and kernel, you're adding moisture from those other components. So typically there, the finished product will be 45% uh, uh, moisture. As we get into shelled corn, we'll see in the middle column our desired is 28 to 32% kernel moisture. You can move up from that and see that the cob uh, does add some moisture, and so that's a bit wetter. So the most desirable from a preservation standpoint and also uh, an end product feeding standpoint would be somewhere around 30% kernel moisture uh, plus or minus. Uh, recognize that uh, that may not be attainable in, in uh, many situations as we seek to get that corn harvested. And so the maximum that we're listing here uh, for shelled corn uh, would be 36% uh, kernel moisture. Again, if it's uh, high moisture ear corn, if someone were to harvest that, that would be a bit wetter, a maximum of 40%. Of um, as you come down and look at uh, some of your bottom unloading silos, oxygen limiting silos, there you see uh, a bit drier, and that's really simply from a uh, storage and unloading standpoint uh, relative to those other silos. So again, if we can do really nothing uh, more uh, with some of this better weather that we've had, uh, nothing more than get corn down to, to under 35% kernel moisture, it's just a lot less risky for us from the standpoint of an undesirable fermentation in that silo, some of this yeast ethanol type issue, and then also uh, from the standpoint of uh, feeding it in terms of uh, starch availability in, in uh, dairy cattle diets. Uh, those uh, I see here source Mike uh, Rank in 2009. That is one of the postings up on the Team Grains uh, website. Uh, and, and certainly goes into a lot more detail uh, than what, what I just did. Some other options, uh, again, with the high moisture corn uh, storage would be to add some sort of an additive to uh, help with the fermentation or to uh, essentially preserve the corn. Uh, certainly uh, in the years that have ensued since the mid 1970s when a lot of this research was done at the Marshfield Station by uh, Howard Larson and, and others. Um, there's been a lot of changes to both biological, um, more inoculant based products and then al also to mixed organic acid products versus straight propionic acid. Uh, one of those is uh, Lactobacillus buchneri. It's a specific uh, Lactobacillus organism that we can add to primarily corn silage or high moisture corn. And the benefit there is that it's a hetero-fermentative organism that produces not only lactic acid but also acetic acid. So it's been shown to have more benefit on uh, aerobic stability on feed out and more benefit regarding yeast uh, from the acetate contribution. And so this is commonly being used now in many situations on, as I said, corn silage, but also high moisture corn. Uh, one of the challenges with that particular organism and the products that have that is that it does tend to have a slower fermentation from the standpoint of producing the acetic acid. So it might be quite effective on uh, yeast and very high or uh, wet high moisture corn. Uh, it may not be so effective at shutting down uh, mold if mold is, is the major concern uh, on, a, on a particular harvest. Uh, having said that, there's also products that would be combination type products. They would have a lactobacillus plantarum to produce lactic acid and drop the pH very quickly along with this lactobacillus buchneri to produce the acetate. So the combination products might be more effective than the straight buchneri. And also there are other products that would have uh, organisms that might uh, be more directed at aerobic stability in yeast than uh, simply dropping the pH. And so those would be the type of inoculant products uh, that, would I, that I would look for uh, versus our kind of uh, uh, standard uh, 
lactobacillus plantarum or strep facium type uh, products. Uh, next would be propionic acid. We'll talk about that in, in a little more detail, but uh, that originally was used uh, at the Marshfield Station as a way of essentially directly acidifying high moisture corn, lowering the pH uh, to close to 4, and also having some effects uh, on uh, mold growth uh, in storage. And so that's certainly been around, and we can talk about that. Um, the good news is a lot of those products now are buffered propionic acids, so they're not as corrosive as what they once were. And also much of the research in the past 10 or 15 years is really focused on mixed acid products, so maybe some um, benzoic acid or acetic acid again or citric acid to have dual effects both on uh, mold through the propionate and then also the yeast and aerobic stability through these uh, other other acids. And lastly, I, I'm reluctant to put up uh, the anhydrous ammonia or, or aqua ammonia because it's uh, really not been used uh, much in the past 10 or 15 years in preserving corn silage. Uh, but certainly the question did come up this week. Uh, anhydrous ammonia uh, or aqua ammonia are certainly antifungal. It has been shown in corn silage to uh, have um, effects on aerobic stability on feed out and yeast. But the challenges with this are certainly the safety aspects, uh, having the proper equipment such as a cold flow unit to do it, and then getting uh, sufficient retention of the ammonia on what's really a, a, a pretty dry uh, corn crop. Typically with corn silage, when we get above 40% dry matter, we have a lot of loss of the ammonia, uh, and it's just not nearly as effective. And now we're talking about high moisture corn that will be 65% uh, dry matter. So uh, I want to throw it out there. It's certainly nothing that I uh, would recommend at this point, but the questions uh, were raised this week, and, and I think uh, it does need to be addressed. And finally, along those lines, the question came in of, of applying a 28% nitrogen fertilizer to uh, corn. And uh, did a little uh, background checking on that from the components of that. And, and again, that's nothing that we would uh, want to recommend to people uh, just from the uh, safety standpoint on feed out and also the effectiveness uh, of adding uh, nitrogen more in a urea or a nitrate form than in, a, in an aqua ammonia form. So kind of on that list, uh, certainly the inoculants from the standpoint of wet corn, uh, and concern about yeast uh, ethanol fermentation, as we move more to a concern about mold, I think we start to shift more towards a, a propionic acid or a mixed acid uh, type, type product. S mentioned that I would follow up a bit on propionic acid. This is a table out of the um, materials that are on the Team Grains website by Mike Rankin. And it looks at the recommended application rates of propionic acid to, to preserve high moisture corn. Uh, this is in pounds per uh, 1,000 pounds of wet corn. And you can see those application rates are, are really quite high uh, in the area of uh, 10 to 20 pounds uh, of propionic acid per wet ton. Uh, propionic acid is roughly a dollar uh, per pound, plus or minus. So the concerns about cost of that application and the cost relative to drying uh, get voiced uh, quite quickly. Uh, a point to recall about this slide, and, and I believe that this original publication from Marshfield is, is either posted or, or will be posted on the Team Grain site. These application rates were really for corn that was stored in open storage or stored in wood bins. Uh, not being harvested and preserved uh, in a silo. So certainly these rates would be on the high side, and if you have very good mixing, like you often would putting into a silo, and you have those anaerobic conditions, the work that I've looked at would suggest in a silo type setting around a half percent, so uh, roughly 10 pounds of uh, propionic acid or a mixed acid product uh, per ton of, of wet corn uh, that's going in. 
But I encourage you to go back and look at that original work, really some very good work. They did it in um, certainly open storage and, and just uh, open bins and then finally in silos. And the lowest application rate that I could find to really hang my hat on would be a half percent uh, or 10 pounds, uh, excuse me, 10 pounds per uh, wet ton. Okay, some additional uh, comments on harvest and storage. Uh, there is an advantage of dry shelled corn, and I believe you need to be aware of that, done properly to the right moisture and and with controlled dry matter in storage, it certainly will shut down many of these issues with further mold growth and, and yeast. Uh, won't necessarily uh, do much to the mycotoxins that have come in through the field uh, in the heating process, but certainly uh, does preserve it. Uh, number two, it does give you the ability to exclude the fines, and oftentimes we would expect mycotoxins to be more concentrated in the fines. So to the extent that we uh, get those excluded through just normal uh, handling and movement of dry grain, that can be a positive. And then finally, on the feeding side, it is much easier to dilute if we do find a high mycotoxin problem. Uh, because we're not concerned about removal rate from the silo and aerobic stability on, on feed out. So that's things to keep in mind, uh, some potential advantages. Obviously, there's plenty of disadvantages with doing that route in terms of getting it out of the field not as quick and, and drying costs and those sorts of things, particularly if, if we don't have the capacity to handle it. But uh, you need to be aware that the drying does have some, some advantages in terms of how we work through and feed through this corn later on. Uh, certainly with snap leaves, the advantage is it can be gotten off yesterday, so to speak. Just want to keep in mind that the window uh, for snap leaves closes pretty rapidly in that the drier you get, uh, the more challenges we have there with uh, storage molds and uh, feeding issues. So you're typically looking at 40 to 45 percent product moisture as you get drier than that, uh, snappage is, is not, uh, not quite uh, so, so favorable from a, a harvest standpoint. Finally, high moisture shelled corn, again, is the intermediate solution between drying and, and snapping the ear. And one uh, point I want to make again is leave the cob in the field, uh, go with shelled corn. Uh, a point I want to make again, 35% kernel moisture and less is less risky from a yeast ethanol uh, aerobic stability standpoint than moving up to wetter moistures. Um, with high moisture corn in a silo, you're really relying on exclusion of oxygen and rapidly uh, achieving a very low pH. And so the standard packing and harvest recommendations for high moisture corn certainly hold if we want to shut down uh, a lot of this yeast and mold growth. And then also, as mentioned, some of these inoculants can help uh, lower that pH and also produce uh, some acids other than lactic acid that might be effective. Uh, again, I uh, want to re-mention uh, in a bit of a summary that if wet uh, corn and yeast is your major concern rather than mold, then the inoculants uh, or a mixed organic product would be more effective than probe. If your major concern is mold, uh, then a, a higher rate of propionic acid uh, would, would likely be um, the more effective or, or the more uh, conservative approach. Uh, one thing to think about is to try to plan your storage so that we can feed up the worst corn uh, before spring and summer. Uh, corn that's very wet and maybe has some uh, yeast issues uh, can be less stable on feed out. And so if we can uh, try to uh, get that bad corn fed out in the winter months uh, and then use some of our drier, better corn uh, as we go into later in the year with warmer temperatures, um, that certainly would, would be very prudent. And lastly, and it may be difficult to achieve uh, because wet corn tends to process a bit in just normal harvest and, and, uh, and handling, but we really just need a, a very coarse roll uh, on a very wet high moisture corn. That's really adequate uh, from the standpoint of uh, rumen bacteria and digestion. If we take a very wet high moisture corn and grind that very fine,
we can get into some real issues with rumen acidosis and fat test. And I do indicate in here uh, 2,500 microns is a pretty good mean particle size or even a little bit coarser for high moisture corn. Uh, and with dry corn, we're often down to about 700 microns. So it is much coarser. And if you're going to be wetter, uh, err on the coarser side. OK, a few feeding issues that uh, come up with uh, corn. I'm going to break this out into the dry shelled corn and then the uh, high moisture type product. One with dry shelled corn would be a test weight issue. And that's going to be a bigger issue. Uh, the less mature that corn was when the killing frost occurred. And then also the molt uh, my mycotoxin issues uh, can be there uh, as well. Pulled out a slide that uh, Mike Rankin has with a nice discussion in his paper on the uh, Team Grains website. And this work was uh, done at the University of Minnesota some years ago. And essentially, they harvested corn uh, at uh, varying maturities and then uh, artificially dried that at uh, two drying temperatures and looked at test weight. Uh, I recognize this is a bit of a confusing slide, but on the far left side, we would start out with the most immature corn at harvest. And on the far right side would be uh, the dry corn harvest. And essentially, the uh, lightest uh, color bar, the one on the far left in each of these sets, would be the test weight at harvest. And then uh, finally, you uh, move into the test weight uh, after drying. And it's kind of interesting. If we get over to about 34% or 34% kernel moisture at harvest, uh, on up to 17.5% kernel moisture, the test weight at, uh, uh, after drying or at feed out uh, from the bin would be right around 56 uh, pounds per bushel. If you back up to these very early harvest, and, and hopefully we don't uh, have much of that out there, now we can see some test weights uh, that will sit uh, under 50 pounds uh, down into to the mid 40s uh, in, in test weight. So certainly drying uh, does, uh, on this kind of normal maturity, does increase uh, test weight. Uh, but then you can also see uh, in the maturities that I hope we're dealing with from black layer and beyond, uh, test weights were really not uh, adversely affected in the dried product. If you do run into some light corn, and light corn from the Minnesota work with steers was anything less than 50 pounds per bushel weight, from that work with beef steers, you could discount that energy value by 5%. So if you had a TDN value, for example, of 85% in normal corn, take that times 0.95, roughly 81% TDN. So a very crude way of adjusting it. But if you've got light corn, that's the least you should probably do when you're feeding it. Uh, 52 on up to 56, we wouldn't really expect uh, any discount needed based on that data that I just uh, presented. Uh, another very simple thing that you need to make sure you do is feed uh, light corn uh, by weight and not by volume uh, so that you get the, the proper uh, amounts uh, being fed. And then finally, uh, we can test for nutrient composition, uh, starch, uh, protein, uh, other nutrients. And the labs can actually use a, a very uh, more recent equation to estimate uh, the proper uh, energy value and nutritionists can, can adjust rations. And then finally on the feed out we can test for mycotoxins and we've got some options there if necessary. Uh, we can certainly dilute. Uh, there are some binding agents that are out there that uh, can tie up some mycotoxin. That's another option. And unfortunately if we were to combine a uh, bad storage situation with a bad field situation uh, in the past, we've run into select situations where it was better to discard bad corn uh, than to actually feed it. So really, from my standpoint, we do the best that we can on the front end. On the back end, let's test it, see what we're dealing with, and then try to, to take the best measures that we can to, uh, to feed our way through it. With the high moisture shell corn, some of the issues that I would see potentially reduce starch content on very wet corn, a very fast rate and extent of digestion of starch in the rumen. Uh, 
uh, potential for yeast ethanol fermentation, potential for poor aerobic stability during feed out, and also uh, the mold uh, mycotoxin uh, issues. So as so we start talking corn above this 35 or 36 percent kernel moisture, the potential for many of these fast rate of starch digestion, uh, yeasty fermentation, aerobic stability uh, can actually increase. So uh, that I think becomes real important as, as we uh, look at high moisture corn and, and uh, see whether any of these potential uh, issues show up. I do want to mention snaplage and that we did have a lot of questions uh, coming in on that. Uh, certainly snaplage, reduced starch content, higher NDF, uh, greater variability, and many of the other issues that uh, you see with uh, wet high moisture uh, corn. Uh, so the challenge there is certainly measuring um, the fiber and, and uh, starch and, and predicting the energy concentration. From the standpoint of high moisture shell corn and snaplage, uh, look at uh, testing uh, for NDF and starch, predicting the energy uh, from nutrient composition, measuring particle size uh, of those products. Uh, we do have the ability to do fermentation profiles to look at lactic acid, acetic acid, ethanol, and help us make better decisions. And uh, finally, again, uh, we can test for uh, mycotoxins. And uh, dealing with that is certainly adjusting the rations based on nutrient composition, primarily the energy value, but also the particle size of that kernel. We might have to substitute in some dry shell corn to dilute, uh, but there that's where this feed out issue becomes a concern, particularly in spring and summer. Uh, we may need to use more buffers uh, with uh, a very digestible wet corn. And also, we may need to do some dilution with uh, some high fiber byproduct sources, dilution of, of the starch. But those are really down the road issues that uh, we can't really deal with until we have uh, the nutrient analyses on that corn as we're feeding it out. Certainly a very simple and a, and a major issue with feeding very wet corn and wetter than normal corn is simply measuring routinely the moisture dry matter content and adjusting the as-fed amounts uh, on a very frequent basis so we're feeding the proper amount of, of dry matter. Uh, if we get into bunk stability issues on feed out, we may need to look at some of the back end products. Uh, these are mixed organic acid products that can be added into the TMR. And then finally, really the same results as with dry shelled corn with mycotoxins. Test it and then look at our options, whether that needs to be dilution uh, binding agents or uh, a discard of, of some of that bad feed. I want to lay out the resources. They're up on the Team Grain website. Uh, certainly Mike Rank and Pat Hoffman have had some application. And then finally one that really covers uh, much of what uh, Paul uh, Eastger and myself have presented today on some of these uh, mold and uh, feeding issues uh, is up there as well. And lastly, I recognize there's a number of uh, nutritionists likely in, in the audience and um, we do get into some more detail on some of the nutrition uh, issues and uh, lay out the uh, website uh, for uh, dairy cattle nutrition extension as we put together more things on some of the binding agents and uh, some of the feed out issues as we go into the winter period uh, likely those uh, will uh, go up go up onto this uh, nutrition website